And I want to welcome you to what I think is the 12th uh, joint speaker series. We grow uh, in audience and popularity each time, which is a great thing. I think it means that people are coming back and new people are coming. And I'm certainly delighted to see that happen. And for everybody that's here, I'd welcome you back to the next one as well. Um, these have been put together by my office, uh, primarily by Lisa LaValle, who, after 11 previous tries, managed to put together my two favorite things, food and science. <laughs> <laughs> Among other things, re Lisa writes a script for my remarks, which I seldom read. Uh, and now I really want to go off script. This is not in it. This will be my, I'm retiring at the end of the month. And this will be my last uh, time in this, on the stage for these. I look forward to coming back and sitting in the audience for many more. And I think it's an appropriate time to give thanks to Lisa for all that she's done. This really has been her idea. The parties are hers. She puts the whole thing together. She has help from other people in the office, to be sure. But she's really done a fantastic job for this. And I would ask for a round of applause for that. Lisa. So tonight's subject is food and science, and it will follow a format we've used before, namely to have a moderator and some panelists discuss the subject. The moderator in this case uh, is Tim Meyer, who's the chief operating officer at Fermilab. These are the joint, the joint and the joint speaker series means joint between the University of Chicago, Argonne, and Fermilab. And Tim is, as I said, chief operating officer at Fermilab. He was previously a Triumph, which is the closest thing that Canada has as an equivalent to Fermilab where he was director of strategic planning and communications. By a strange coincidence, the director of both of these labs was Nigel Lockyer. So Tim's been working for Nigel for a long time. He is, from the description I've given, he would appear to be a bureaucrat like the rest of us, and he is. But he is also a card-carrying high-energy physicist. And more recently, he has become a considerable expert in farming. As a matter of fact, if he keeps at it, he might be promoted to chief farming officer at Fermilab. <laughs> Fermilab, there, there is it's a little known fact that farming is done at Fermilab, and the chief operating officer has to worry about how this gets done, and Tim does. I think without further ado, I will invite Tim up to the stage to start the program. All right, good evening. Thank you. Thank you, Don, for opening this event and that kind introduction. I just want to mention, if you're here for a jazz performance, uh, you came to the wrong evening. Uh, but I'm honored to have a chance to share tonight's stage with uh, some amazing brains, as well as uh, stomachs of, of good respect. I'm from Fermilab, where we make and study particles of many types. We really like neutrinos right now. Uh, but as Sergey will tell you, you've got to make protons first in order to produce the neutrinos. And you might wonder, what's the connection between Fermilab and food? And I would say there's really only two connections. Uh, both start with the letter F. And the second is that Fermilab, we do like to eat, which perhaps you can tell. But uh, we'll come back to that later. Uh, and yes, I'm going to try to use food puns, metaphors, and references all evening. So I hope you can swallow that. <laughs> Thank you. Well-trained audience. Uh, bartender, another. Um, now, I've been waiting for tonight's session for months. If you think the election polls are open to interpretation or perhaps biased or some of the worst math and science on television, just wait until you ask a colleague about food, diet, nutrition, how do humans eat, how should we be eating. Among 10 friends, you'll get something like uh, 12 opinions and six requests for you to pick up the check. But fortunately, we have some luminaries here tonight who will shed some light on our appetite for understanding. So let me ask, are you hungry for some science? Yeah. All right, I, I can't quite hear you. Are you hungry for some science? Yeah. All right. Thank you. So I do have to say a few things about how we'll run tonight's program. If you haven't been here before, it's got a particular format. You will hear for, you're going to hear from four speakers who will each give a TED-style talk of about 10 minutes, hopefully less. Uh, overview of their work and how it relates to food. No offense, guys. Um, but after each talk, I'll reappear. We'll take a time for a few questions from the audience. But the, the entree here, if you will, actually comes at the end, when we actually bring up all four speakers and let you feast on them. So uh, bear that in mind. Um, and if you don't have a chance to ask your question immediately, save it for, for uh, at the end of the program. Now, before I yield to my gourmet colleagues, I do have to acknowledge our master chef, uh, Don Levy. So as Don mentioned, uh, he is retiring. He's been a driving force at the University of Chicago and its national laboratories, I think, for a little less than 100 years. 
And this joint speaker series is uh, just one of a number of these uh, groundbreaking partnership producing initiatives that are really his doing. So thank you, Don, for seeing the light and actually helping the rest of us see the light. We're part of a same family. So Don. Okay, well, that's enough from me. So since we're hungry for enlightenment, let me turn to our first, uh, our first speaker. Uh, so Joshua Elliott is a research scientist at the, and fellow at the Computation Institute at the University of Chicago and uh, Argonne. Joshua works on a variety of topics at the interface of global change, environmental and social sciences through a variety of applied modeling and computational projects. He also happens to be a reformed particle theorist, so I'm proud to salute. He found uh, work using uh, his skills. And I'd also like to note, although he is a vegetarian, he once helped kill a chicken at the age of seven. I <laughs> also want to mention, if you douse anything in butter and cook it on a campfire on the beach, uh, he will likely eat it. But let's please welcome Joshua to the stage as our first course. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate that. That took a lot of the... I was really worried about having to follow that inspirational video, but Tim made it so much easier now. So thank you. Thank you very much, Tim. I really appreciate that. OK. Um, I'm not allowed to stand behind the podium, is that right? That's what I was told. Uh, Tim stood behind the podium. Why does he get to stand behind the podium? All right. Um, I'm assuming my title slide, that's a very simple title slide. I like that. OK. Um, I was uh, told, Lisa told me I had to tell a story today, um, and so I, I don't really know any good stories, so I decided to tell you uh, the story of my research group uh, at the Computation Institute um, and the Center for Robust Decision Making and Climate Energy Policy, um, and how we went, uh, starting eight years ago, how we went from uh, studying global change to studying uh, sort of re resilience in the food system, and hopefully learning a few lessons here and there, both about research, about the food system, uh, about feeding, every, et cetera, et cetera. So I, I'll get back to the title in a second. Um, because I know I'm going to run out of time and get chased out of sta off the stage before I finish my slides, I'm going to go ahead and give you the, the lesson up front. So spoiler alert. Uh, this is going to be a story basically about scales. It's going to be a story about the transition of research from, from very large um, global scale phenomena that act on multi-decadal time scales and affect the planet long, a long time in the future. Um, down to, to, to research working on, on uh, relatively small scales and on phenomena that work at seasonal and sub-seasonal scales uh, to affect uh, populations and food, and, and food security and people um, immediately and in the now, and I'll sort of explain that. And also about looking at, you know, going from multi-decadal climate change to looking at climatic events uh, that happen at, in the annual, seasonal, or even smaller time scales, and, and really trying to learn from each crisis that's happening, how can we adapt to and prepare for climate change um, as these crises become more frequent and worse and et cetera, and you know, hence, my, hence my title with the crises and stuff. So, so we can all just go home now, or, but there's, they gave us free drinks and stuff, so I might as well, just, I might as well finish, right? Okay, all right, all right, I'll, I'll go through the slides. Okay, so um, at the Computation Institute, uh, we started our, our Global Change Research Program in 2008. If you'll recall, 2008 was a very exciting time. Uh, new administration heading into Washington. National and even global climate change policy was inevitably just around the corner. And the only question was, how do we design the optimal policy that will reduce greenhouse gas emissions fast enough, but without uh, unduly slowing economic growth, without um, you know, reducing job growth, and et cetera. And so we at the Computation Institute built giant computational models, as we do, uh, to study global policy and global change, and to, to address topics like um, the leakage of environmental pollution through national climate policies, the leakage of, of wealth and capital to unregulated countries if a, if a country tries to regulate carbon by itself. And we published a bunch of papers on this in economics journals. We even published one paper in a law journal, so we wanted to get the lawyers, the international tax lawyers, excited about, about carbon border tax adjustments and, 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 and carbon leakage and stuff. I don't know if they ever did. I, I think only David Weisbach got excited about it, but you know, it's easy to get him excited about things, so I don't think that was a huge win. We also um, were really interested. He's not here, is he? No, I don't think so. Okay, good. Um, 
Uh, we also, uh, we also were uh, really interested in studying different alternative energy technologies to look at which ones of these technologies were closest to that sweet spot in their cost curve where they could provide the, uh, the, the, you know, the most efficient way at reducing greenhouse gases um, in, in, the, in the cheapest way and getting us to a clean energy future as fast and as cheaply as possible. And this is actually where we first come across, came across studying agriculture um, through the topic of biofuels, working closely with folks um, at Argonne. Um, and we published a lot of papers on that, again, on how biofuels are going to affect food systems, how biofuels are affect land use change, um, competitions with food, and et cetera. Um, and uh, at, uh, we at RIDCEP, we still work on mitigation topics uh, because mitigation is really important. Um, if you want to avoid the truly devastating consequences of climate change over the long term, um, I apologize. This is a picture of New York City underwater. I couldn't find a picture of Chicago underwater, so <laughs> forgive me for the topical Miss, you know, for the locational mismatch, but I didn't, I didn't try very hard, but still, I, 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 didn't, I didn't find one, so I'll just, uh. um, But we realized, um, so in 2010, in late 2010, um, I don't know if you'll remember this, but it started to look a little less likely that national uh, climate policy was going to get passed any time in the near future. Um, so we took uh, sort of a look at the pathway that the world was on, and we concluded that um, the world was really firmly on sort of the worst possible emissions pathway that you can imagine. And indeed, ever since then, we have stayed on that worst possible emissions pathway that's considered by uh, the IPCC. Um, and, uh, and, we, and we thought about it, and um, we concluded that we're really likely to stay on that path, really no matter what happens at this point, until at least about 2020. Um, now, all that extra CO2 in the atmosphere, that puts traps extra heat in the Earth's system. That heat initially mostly goes into this giant, enormous heat sink we call the ocean, where it rattles around for a few decades before finally equilibrating with the atmosphere. So uh, what that means, effectively, is that, um, is that even if we stopped emissions now, even if we stabilized atmospheric CO2, it would take probably 30 to 40 years before global surface temperatures actually stopped rising. Um, so put another way, the, the sort of because of the inertia in the Earth system and because of the inertia, in the, especially in the, so, in the economic and political systems, a large percentage of the climate change that we expect by, say, 2050 is really already baked into the system. And there's kind of nothing we can do about it at this point. Um, so we decided we needed to figure out how to maybe prepare for that, at least in, in some capacity. So we launched a new initiative through RIDSEP uh, that would eventually become our impacts group. Um, and we started off by, by trying to focus on issues of uh, food security, adapting to climate change in agriculture, and, and producing enough food uh, to feed the planet over the next, over the next decades. Um, in 2012, we joined a large international project with 40 other research groups from around the world to do the first ever model intercomparison project to synthesize knowledge on climate change impacts across a variety of different sectors. Uh, we led the agricultural sector for this, and what we found is a couple of robust things amidst a mass of uncertainty, uh, which is that um, um, on presently uh, harvested agricultural lands, climate change could mean anything from a 8 to a 45% reduction in productivity, uh, um, and, and that a lot of that negative productivity is happening in low-latitude regions where food insecurity and indeed rapid population growth are already you know, huge, huge problems, obviously. Um, and finally, also, that there are actually potentially big opportunities that are going to start emerging in the far northern uh, latitudes, like Canada, northern Siberia, and et cetera, that could compensate for these, but will, again, dramatically change the sort of uh, north-south distribution of, uh, of food production even further. We also combine these results with a, uh, an ensemble of wa global water models uh, uh, from a group within the same project, because we wanted to look at how will fresh water availability over the next century impact, uh, in fact, the productivity of food. And what we found is that in dozens of uh, river basins around the world, the ones in the pink and red here, um, constraints in freshwater availability over the next many decades imply the reversion of between 20 and 60 million hectares of land from, from irrigated cropland to rain-fed cropland, which, it, which ends up equaling about uh, as big of a, a negative shock to to uh, agricultural productivity as the direct effects of climate change itself, so sort of doubling climate impacts, let's say. All right, so that was great. It was good. And climate change is really important. Climate change is going to make food, pro food production and productivity uh, much more challenging and complicated in the future. Um, but climate change is not the whole story. Uh, global change is a whole lot more than just 
you know, relatively uh, slow, steady changes in atmospheric conditions. Um, and, and in order to do a consistent sort of analysis of food security um, and, and, you know, hunger and health over even a, you know, multi-decadal time scale at all, you really need to take into account potentially dozens of other large-scale global forces associated with human influences and environmental externalities. Um, and so we set about to try and do that. And, and climate is not changing in a vacuum. I really like that, so I should say that out loud as well. So global what is global change? Well, global change is population growth, of course. Um, I'm going to use the laser backwards. No, global change is population growth. Global change is, is rapidly increasing wealth, and especially ch uh, changes in, the, in, the dis in disparities in how wealth is being distributed. Global change is rapidly increasing demand for meat and animal products, especially in those, in those increasingly wealthy households. Uh, global change is, is, is increasing extreme events, both uh, droughts and floods impacting, impacting uh, uh, farmers around the world. It's also depleting freshwater resources, both surface and groundwater, which are drying up around the planet, both from overuse and from climate change. Global change is also deforestation and habitat loss um, and loss of species around the planet at really rapid and concerning rates. But then global change is also rapid technological growth, uh, which, is, um, which is, you know, has the potential to rapidly increase productivity, both in agriculture and in other sectors. Uh, it's also technology that, uh, that is providing us with new data and information that is allowing us to make better decisions about farm management and how to manage the environments uh, around farms and reduce, farm exter uh, and reduce uh, external environmental externalities from farms. Um, and then finally, global change is also the sort of in innate human um, ability to adapt um, and to take advantage of, of changes as they occur, including, including by growing crops in far frozen reaches of Manitoba that really have no business being there and even harvesting them while they still have snow all over them. Um, and a lot of these things, just like greenhouse gas emissions and just like climate change, a lot of these things are, are growing rapidly um, and in fact exponentially in many cases. And, 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 and are really reaching regimes that are just well outside of anything we have any historical context for whatsoever. Um, and that's, that's troubling, just like it is with climate change and, and CO2. All right, so population, I'll just do, I'll just, I'll just do the easy ones. So population uh, is uh, it's growing, continuing to grow, as everybody knows. It's projected to reach well over uh, 9 billion by 2050. Um, and at the same time, it's projected that per capita wealth and urbanization will also increase rapidly over that time, especially in the, in the developing countries. Um, at the same time, what we, we know that, that wealth, uh, increasing wealth, um, also drives an increasing demand for food calories, and most importantly, an increasing demand for, the, for a fraction of those food calories to come from animal products. Um, so let's just take, for example, China, which is... Uh, in 2010 was about here at about 5,000 uh, US dollars per capita GDP and was consuming about 60 kilograms uh, of, of meat per capita. By, um, by 2050, China is expected to be about here at about 30,000 uh, US dollars per capita GDP and consuming almost double, uh, perhaps even double, uh, the meat consumption they consume now. So that means a country um, consuming per capita about as much meat as the average American uh, but with four, maybe even five times as many people in it. Um, and um, this population growth, increasing meat consumption, and a lot of other factors that we know way too much about, like biofuels and everything else, and, um, and, 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 loss, of, and loss of agricultural land, led, led um, a United Nations panel in 2009 to say that food production by 2050 was going to have to double in order to meet growing demand and reduce hunger, hunger which is... It's a, it's a really big number. I mean, I, we might not have good, I don't have, I don't even have good context for it, but doubling by 20, it's a really, it's a really, it's a lot. Um, when you add to that the fact that, um, that meat consumption is actually um, quite a lot more input intensive than, than production of other food pr products and that a lot of this growth is going to be in meat production, um, that m further complicates the story. So it's estimated, depending on how you count it, that to produce one unit of, of, um, of, of protein from animal products, Requ uh, requires something like um, an order of magnitude more grain, uh, water, fossil fuels, and emissions compared to producing the equivalent amount of protein from vegetal products. So, so all of that together means that there's a huge amount of pressure now 
growing amount of pressure on the demand side of the food system at the same time that the stresses on the supply side from climate change um, are, are becoming more and more severe. And, and the likely outcome from that is, is more frequent and bigger disruptions to the global food system. And that can manifest either as domestic shocks um, in, um, in regions that, have, that, have, that are already food insecure and that don't have the abilities to go out on the global market to make up for, for local domestic shortfalls, or it can, or it can manifest as, as, as production shocks in large breadbasket regions, uh, which affect global markets and global prices and have significant implications in regions that are import dependent because they don't have enough domestic capacity uh, to feed their own populations. And that includes um, you know, most Middle Eastern and North African countries. Um, and then here, of course, the best example is you know, the continuing large scale drought we're seeing right now in Ethiopia and to a smaller extent, the drought we're seeing um, in India as well. All right, so um, then, uh, well, what can we do about it? So in 2014, um, we joined a task force called the UK-US Task Force on Extreme Weather and Global Food System Resilience to try and estimate uh, the scale and scope of this problem from continental to global scales. Uh, we used the uh, available data to estimate both what, are the, uh, what is the size of sort of a rare event shocks in both present and future climates, and looked at um, you know, whether and, ha and to what extent those shock sizes are likely to grow in future as climate grows. And um, the ultimate conclusion is that uh, the kind of event that in the 20th century we would have called a one in a hundred year extreme shock event, by the middle of the century is likely to occur something like once every 30 years. So a really kind of dramatic uh, acceleration in, in the frequency of these extreme food shock events. Um, so what are we going to, so what, what are we going to do about it? Well, um, again, we're going to move to finer and finer scales, as I said, with our research products. So um, uh, right now at the CI, we're, our, our goal, um, you know, what, what, can, what can people do about these food shock events? Well, if, if farmers, if governments, if NGOs have advanced warning about these events before they occur, then they can chain, do extreme management practices. They can um, release food from reserves. They can change policies over on biofuels and other things um, to try and stem the effect that these events have on domestic on domestic uh, populations and on global markets. Um, so what, uh, the currently the, the, the sort of tools that are available to help to, to project these events in real time as they're happening operate at very coarse resolutions. They don't account for all the data that is available. And, they, and they're updated only at a very, very low frequency. So we're developing um, tools now at the CI that take advantage of some of our technologies to assimilate satellite data in real time at a high frequency that assimilate um, uh, both short and long-term climate forecasts from models run at NOAA and INCAR and other places uh, that assimilate soil and management and environmental data all through sort of high-resolution farm system models in order to produce real-time, accurate, um, um, high-frequency projections of how food production um, is likely to evolve, of how the harvest is likely to evolve throughout the season. Um, and this is just a random example that is fun I won't really go into. And then finally, translating that all into you know, large-scale, high-resolution maps for food insecure regions that can help to identify hotspots of, of, um, of, of potential sort of food insecurity before they emerge with anywhere from months to, you know, for any, with anywhere from weeks to potentially several months of lead time before the disasters actually strike. All right, so finally, um, we have reached the, the finest scale. So we started out with... Uh, using global, uh, global policy models, global trade models to model global policy and its impacts at the, at the global level. And we're now down to improving early warning and drought monitoring systems uh, before local up to like regional scales. Um, so where do we go next? Well, of course, the next step is that uh, we're going to apply these same tools at sub-farm level uh, using precision agriculture applications and at 10 meter resolution in order to try and help farmers increase productivity while simultaneously reducing uh, their fertilizer usage, reducing their irrigation usage, and improving both environment and productivity at the same time. But that is not a story for tonight. That's a story for next time whenever we have this food uh, related talk. So I'll just leave you with uh, this one picture of food from around the world. So this is four random families from four random countries and the food that they choose just to remind you that food is a choice 
And the choices that we make, both as consumers and producers, are really important, and they impact things around the globe. So make good choices. Thank you. So all of the land and water resources are going that we need to grow vegetables and uh, food for people is going into feed for animals. And with all of the problems with water, soil degradation, uh, pesticide use, antibiotic resistance, etc., it seems like it just isn't sustainable, and we have to do something about making people realize that. In order to solve the, the problem from the demand side, it requires a sort of a holistic view of food waste and diets and a lot of other things. Um, Absolutely, you know, if everyone in America became vegetarian tomorrow, that would go a long way to solving the problem. But we also need to recognize that, that meat plays a very important cultural and nutritional role in a lot of parts of the world. So you, you can't just say meat is the problem. The, it's, you can pro it's probably safe to say that the, that the industrial meat industry in the Western world is largely unsustainable, or at least a large contributor to the problem of unsustainability. Uh, there's no doubt about that. But we, we need a solution. We can't really sort of blame it on, on one or another industry. We really need a solution that looks holistically at the food system, reduces waste, um, improves diets you know, across especially the developed world, um, and, and, and improves productivity um, all at the same time to sort of produce enough food for everyone. So as a former uh, PhD physicist myself, I must say I think Joshua got the taste of your job. Uh, Next up is uh, Kathy Morrison, the Newcomb Family Professor of Anthropology uh, and of Social Sciences and Chair of the University of Chicago's Anthropology Department. Kathy studies the archaeology and historical anthropology of South Asia with a focus on pre-colonial and early, early colonial South India. She's confronted her own share of large snakes, including cobras, while conducting research in the field similar to her often uh, named fictional counterpart, Indiana Jones. She eats adventure for breakfast, but she really loves making tacos and enchiladas for dinner. So please welcome Kathy. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. It's true about the cobras, I will say. So Joshua and I hadn't met before to today, but um, it seems like in some ways our talks are inverses of each other because my talk is also really a talk about scale, um, and a talk about um, the consequences of a lot of small, small actions on um, larger both temporal scales and also spatial scales. And like Josh, I start out with a kind of personal story and talk about the trajectory of my own research and how it comes uh, to put me here in, in a, a situation like this. So sometime around um, 30 years ago, a little more than 30 years ago, I won't say how much more, uh, as a, a beginning graduate student, I was uh, asked to join a research project in India. And I joined a project um, studying the archaeological remains of the city of Bijinagara in southern India. It was the capital of a huge empire that controlled most of southern India between the 14th and 16th century, a period we sometimes refer to as the medieval or middle period. Um, and it was a great opportunity to go to the field and do research. But really the, the main reason, I think, that I agreed uh, to go to this work at this really fabulous site in one of the hottest and driest parts of southern India was the fact that I was a very big fan of Indian food. <laughs> and my best friend in college, uh, mother, was a tremendous cook. And I used to eat uh, her cooking all the time when I was an undergraduate. And I expected that I would get that marvelous Indian food when I went to the field uh, in, uh, in southern India. And uh, when I got to the field, it was a little different than what I had expected. <laughs> South Indian food is quite distinctive from the North Indian food that most uh, Americans uh, experience in restaurants here. And what I came to realize that the food that we were served in camp, this is, was not quite as nice as this tali, um, is a particular sort of cuisine. So the South Indian meal uh, is often referred to as a tali, which is a word referring to the plate. And the plate can either be something like a banana leaf, like you see here, or a metal plate with a lot of little bowls. Um, and the um, plate itself is a kind of metonym for the meal. The center of the South Indian tali is rice. 
All of the other kinds of dishes that occur around it are vegetables, uh, pulses, bananas, things with coconut in them, dairy products. All of these are products, except for dairy products, of um, intensive, cultivated, and, ir and especially irrigated agriculture. So the tali itself represents a very particular type of meal, a very elite form of consumption, as I came to realize. Um, so the kind of uh, meals that we were having in our excavation camp uh, were very like, in many ways, the meals that the people who lived in this vast medieval city um, themselves were eating in the 14th, 15th, and 16th centuries, or at least some of the people who lived in, those, in that medieval city. Besides the kings, the merchants, and the other kind of wealthy people who ate South Indian rice-based uh, and irrigated product-based uh, tallies, uh, the other big consumer of this kind of uh, elite cuisine were the gods. South Indian temple complexes in the medieval period were very large affairs. They had kitchens. They had huge staffs. They often owned significant amounts of agricultural land. And they fed very many people, including the god or goddess as well. And like elite humans, gods enjoyed the same sort of food um, and preferentially uh, rice-based cuisines. So we can see this uh, in very graphic material form uh, in, for example, these kinds of stone tallies that we find sometimes in temple complexes that look exactly like the kinds of meals that people are still eating. The big round plate with the small bowls and the kind of central place accorded for these products of intensive irrigated agriculture. Quite fantastic. And it wasn't too hard to figure out working in the city itself, right on the banks of the Tungabhadra River, one of the few perennial rivers in southern India, how, uh, where all of those uh, irrigated products came from. As you can see here in this picture, there are still fields that are watered um, by canals and um, by uh, aqueducts that were built in the 14th, 15th, and 16th century. So these are still fields that are under production. And they grow, guess what? They grow rice. They grow vegetables. They grow bananas. They grow sugar cane. Um, all the same kinds of things that go into the uh, elite tali. And, and one of the other consequences of this, just a foreshadow I'll say before, is also this obviously represents massive environmental transformation of the landscape. Right? So this is one of the driest parts of southern India. After I spent many years working in the city of Vijayanagara itself, documenting all these um, archaeological remains, uh, for my own dissertation project, and for many, many years later, I moved out from the city in order to look at the larger regional context. So, um, I, we're, we're expanding now from the scale of a single city to the scale of a particular region. But we're on a relatively short, um, short kind of temporal span, only about 300 years. When I went out to look at the area outside of the city and study how the environment had been transformed, how agriculture was organized, I found a completely different universe. Right? A universe of dry farming, a universe of um, uh, where the... Uh, a very precarious universe in which agriculture is extremely risky and very problematic. So it's, it's uh, supported either by, only by, by rain, uh, less than 50 centimeters per year, or by runoff fed reservoirs like you see here. And you can see us standing up on top of it, actually documenting it. These runoff fed reservoirs are very impressive looking kinds of features, but they actually have very, very high failure rates. And the uh, life of a, a farmer out in these rural, dry areas is extremely precarious. What we also see archaeologically and in the historical documents, too, is that the kinds of foods that are associated with the areas outside of the intensive irrigated zone are completely different. Right? So unlike the rice-based tali sitting on a banana leaf that you see here on the right side of the slide, um, the food of ordinary people is based on millets. Instead of rice, dry farmed grains, um, it's, there's um, none of the kinds of uh, extras, the, the uh, coconut, the banana, the other kinds of things, all of these irrigated crops, um, no bananas at all. In fact, either 
as a plate or on the plate. So we see a very different kind of way of life and very different modalities of consumption, just to sort of refer back to Joshua's talk uh, in a minute. These differentiated cuisines then, as we came to know over the course of several hundred years, themselves created differentiated physical landscapes. And the landscapes were affected in various kinds of ways. They were affected in terms of the nature of soils, of the nature of slopes, of vegetation, and also in terms of the kinds of biodiversity that we find um, in those contexts. So what we see here is that the kinds of not only food choices, but the kinds of power relations that exist between people have significant environmental consequences um, that uh, ramify through the, through the generations. So it's not very original or shocking, I think, to an audience like this to make the point that our food choices have consequences. This is a message that we're, we're bombarded with, in a sense, every day. But to get back to, an, uh, to the question of scale again for the moment, we ha it's very easy to think that one small choice can't really have that much impact on uh, the larger system. And in a kind of straightforward empirical sense, that's certainly true, right? But food choices, like other kinds of choices of consumption, many small, many small choices add up to make uh, a big decision. So the work that I did studying the development of elite cuisines in the 14th, 15th, and 16th century then led to another research project, which I won't tell you all about, about the much longer term trajectory of this kind of differentiated food system and these differentiated landscapes that emerged in southern India, this time over the last 5,000 years. So it felt like we were really doing something kind of special then, in a way looking at really long-term changes and what impacts those have on the landscape. But 5,000 years and one little piece of southern India, again, it, you know, it's actually kind of small potatoes, really. So if we think about um, what the longer term impacts of these kinds of food choices, including the things like the production of irrigated rice, then we have to again change our spatial scale quite considerably. Um, and this is a map, uh, this is Earl Ellis's uh, map of global, uh, what he calls anthromes, that is various kinds of uh, anthropogenic environments across the earth right now, today, and you can see in this particular map, it's not a historical map, it's of what's happening now, rice and rice villages are in a kind of an alarming blue color, right? So if we think that rice and the production of rice patties has a particular impact on the Earth system, um, you can see that this is not an inconsequential kind of impact. What kind of impact do things like irrigated rice have on the Earth system? Obviously, there are changes in vegetation. And there are a few, there's, um, these typically become permanent field systems, so there's no regrowth of woody vegetation, so there are changes in carbon sequestration, um, changes in albedo that are always associated with the kinds of vegetation transformations of agricultural production. But also rice paddies and taro, taro pond fields are um, special in a way because they produce methane, uh, which is a greenhouse gas. So what has been the long-term impact of the expansion of rice and rice agriculture in Asia and elsewhere on not only humans and human cultural systems and uh, the distribution of power relations within human societies, but also on the Earth system itself? This is something that my students and I uh, began worrying about uh, quite specifically. So again, we expanded our spatial scale. So from 5,000 years and a focus on Southern Asia, we began to worry more about a period of about 10,000 years, that is the Holocene since the beginning of human agriculture and for the whole globe. So I began work um, co-directing uh, an international um, scientific working group uh, called Land Cover 6K, which is uh, a kind of a... Uh, as I, I think I told the reporter who asked about it, I say an insanely ambitious effort to document not only vegetation change for the last 10,000 years for the globe, primarily by looking at pollen analysis as a proxy record of past vegetation. Vegetation obviously is very important for the Earth system, particularly in terms of carbon cycling and albedo, but other things as well. 
but also looking at the changes in human land use and their relationships to vegetation, because that's very much a black box, often in how we think about the human impact on the Earth. And many people say things about whether people have or have not had a very significant impact on the Earth over the last 10,000 years since we started uh, domesticating plants and animals. But the truth is we, do, we have very poor empirical evidence about what exactly the nature of that impact might be. So in this group, we are working with uh, climate modelers, we're working with ecologists um, and biologists, but uh, quite unusually, it also includes a large number of archeologists, historians, and historical geographers. And we're working to aggregate, to commensurate, and to synthesize um, the actual empirical evidence of pa basically past human history, both land use and then also land cover, vegetation, for the Earth um, in ways that will be useful for uh, global climate models. So we've gone, in a way, kind of full circle in this discussion, and really for me in my own, own uh, uh, research trajectory from a very small scale, very kind of intimate level of analysis to, to um, you know, 10,000 years in the entire globe. We've gone, in a sense, from plate, the plate to the planet, as it were. Um, so when we think about food, it's a very small scale, in a way, a very intimate kind of thing in the matter of consumption. Although, as Joshua pointed out, it's not so much like that when we think about it in terms of the global food system. But it's clear that many small choices can have a significant impact. And it's very difficult for us, I think, to think about these kinds of multiple spatial scales, not only spatial scales, but even more so, I think, these multiple temporal scales to think about where, how we've gotten to this point um, and what kinds of relationships, what kinds of processes um, have got us there. Jeff, what's up? So how have these um, realizations affected you and your colleagues' um, food choices now? Yeah, you know, when I, when I talk about uh, rice and the differences between elite rice-based cuisines and you know, sort of the foods of the poor and millet, uh, particularly in the US uh, where the you know, dynamics of agricultural production are very different. There's always a dinner after the talk, you know, and then people say, oh, I'm really sorry, there's rice for the dinner. <laughs> or, I, or if they didn't listen, then they say, you know, we, we served rice because we know you're really interested. <laughs> I think for everybody, you know, we, 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 we do what we can. And I will say, you know, just as a, uh, an individual human being and not so much as a scholar uh, and as a, a, a professor at the University of Chicago, I, I have uh, three community garden plots, 62nd in Dorchester and two at 65th in Kimbark. So I grow a huge amount of my own food, I'm happy to say, um, in my community gardens, uh, and that's organically. So I, I think that that's, that's something. But the, the other thing about the community garden, of course, is the community part of it, right? So I think that when we think about issues like food, we can't separate them from the kinds of cultural context, from the context of power, and relations of you know, access to resources and cultural specificity, right? Because people make food choices not only as some kinds of you know, uh, you know, rational actors in a kind of economist sense, but they also make choices that make sense to them culturally and in terms of their uh, particular situations in the world. And that makes the world a very complicated place. Thank you. Thank you, Kathy. Thank you again. Thank you. So I, I have to say it, but uh, she's rice about that. <laughs> Good. Well, next, let me uh, move on to our next uh, talented speaker, uh, Catherine Nagler, the Bunning Food Allergy Professor at the University of Chicago. Her most recent work examines how intestinal bacteria regulate susceptibility to allergic responses to food. She also loves Sicily, and not just the people, but also the food. So here to help us savor her work, Catherine. Thank you. 
So how many of you either has a food allergy or know someone who has a food allergy? Yeah, lots of hands. So when I was a kid, my brothers and I ate peanut butter and jelly almost every day for lunch. By the time my kids got to elementary school, their classrooms were peanut free. And food allergies have become an enormous problem in the US and other developed countries. It's now estimated that 15 million Americans suffer from food allergies. Some of these are life-threatening. So they, it seems to present as, as two types of diseases. Um, one of the presentations involves a, a food allergy that develops between ages two and five and resolves on its own. And the other is a lifelong, life-threatening allergic response to food that can send someone to the emergency room uh, every three minutes in the US. So we now have two children in every classroom with food allergies. How do we account for this kind of change in just a generation? So that, that's the question that we're trying to tackle. And our hypothesis is that it's due to changes in what we call the microbiota. That is all of the bacteria that live in and on our bodies. So in the video, you might remember when I mentioned that we are 99% microbial. There are trillions of bacteria living in our intestines that are as yet very poorly understood and control many physiological processes and have a particular impact on the development and function of the immune system. So we're suggesting that what's happened, this, what's caused this generational change is lifestyle practices that have changed the composition of these bacteria. So what are some of these? They're depicted here. The biggest offender by far is antibiotic use. It's estimated that children in the United States have six courses of antibiotics before they're two years old, most of them for viral infections for which antibiotics serve no purpose. We also have extensive exposure to antibiotics subclinically. So you may not know that for 50 years, um, uh, farmers have, have had a practice where they've given their livestock subclinical doses of antibiotics because they knew that that made the livestock fatter and, and more valuable. And um, some have suggested that we've done that same experiment to ourselves and that that's what's driving the epidemic of obesity in this country. So I should mention that we study particularly food allergy, but food allergy is appearing as part of a constellation of diseases that are sometimes called the diseases of Western lifestyle. And they include inflammatory bowel disease, obesity, food allergy, diabetes, autism, asthma, all of which are increasing in parallel. Another major offender is diet. So we've co-evolved with our microbiota over millennia. And as we've heard a little bit about, um, the, our ancestors were not consuming McDonald's. So the diet has changed and our bacteria are eat what we eat and their food source has changed in a way that's changed them seemingly for, for the worse. We've also eliminated previously common enteropathogens. Vaccination had reduced exposure to infectious disease has also changed the composition of our microbiome. And here I want to be very clear that I'm not in any way suggesting that vaccination is not the greatest public health success story in history. But what I am suggesting is that vaccine, you know that being infected with something uh, elicits a very different response than receiving a vaccine against it. The immune system sees them in two different ways. And finally, cesarean birth and formula feedings. And I want to take a little bit of time with that. So we're sterile prior to birth, and the co-evolved strategy is vaginal delivery. That's how we get our founder microbiota. And the microbiota that we um, inherit from our mother's vaginal tract has an, a relationship that evolves over time uh, over an ecological succession between the mother and the mother's interaction with the baby and breastfeeding. That whole um, naturally involved interaction is disturbed by cesarean section birth. And it's been shown that babies born by C-section are instead, their initial founder bacteria can be tracked to the skin of their mother or their caregiver. 
Cesarean birth is associated with higher risk of, of allergic disease, higher susceptibility to pathogens. Early childhood is what we study as the window of opportunity. This is when all of the changes in the immune system are taking place and when it's most susceptible to intervention but also most susceptible to, to damage. And the bacterial populations are changing rapidly. They're very un unstable. But over time, each individual develops their own unique microbiota that possibly changes again when they become elderly. Um, our, the bacteria that live in our gut have a, also a very important role in digesting our food. So many of the common dietary fibers that we ingest are in fact insoluble to us without help from these bacteria that ferment them into products that are essential for our, our health. Among, prominent among these are the short chain fatty acids and we're particularly interested in, in one of these called butyrate that it serves as a critical energy source for the epithelial cells that line our digestive tract and also has other functions for the immune system. So how do we begin to address a problem of understanding which bacterial populations are important for regulating allergic responses to food? We're lucky that here at the University of Chicago we have access to state-of-the-art germ-free mouse facilities. So germ-free mouse means that, that we can raise mice so that they're never exposed to any bacteria at all. They live inside these bubbles. So these white um, things hanging down, these are actually gloves. These are the fingers of the gloves. So in order to work with the mice that are living in here for their entire lives, you have to stick your hands through these gloves and manipulate the mice within these cages. That system allows us to select bacterial populations that we can introduce into the mice specifically and look at how those bacterial populations interact with the immune system. But as I mentioned, we know very little about the microbiota as yet. So how to approach this? What we decided to do was to divide the whole world of intestinal bacteria and these are thousands of different species, many of which are obligate anaerobes. That means that they can't grow when they're exposed to oxygen. So they can't be cultured in, in test tubes. And we know them mostly by their genetic information, by their sequences. So what we decided to do was to compare the, so this is a depiction of the epithelial surface, to compare the bacteria that live in association with the mucus layer to bacteria that are free floating with the digestive food and see if we could get some insight into which of those populations might be important. And in the course of those studies, we did identify a particular population of mucosa associated bacteria called the clostridia that protected against an, um, allergic sensitization to food. And what we found that it does is that it regulates the function of the epithelial lining that, of our digestive tract in a way that increases the production of mucus and increases the production of natural antibiotics, antimicrobial peptides, so it has a barrier protective effect. So then we wanted to apply this to the development of novel therapeutics to prevent or treat food allergy. So to begin to do that, we collaborated with a group in Italy that had done a, a large-scale study examining dietary management of children with cow's milk allergy. And what our collaborator did was to compare, so these are children that come into his clinic with cow's milk allergy, and he put them onto different formulas to see what was most effective at managing their disease. And what he found was that when he gave them a formula that was supplemented with a conventional probiotic, Lactobacillus GG, so this is the probiotic bacteria that's present uh, all through Whole Foods or the, and the, that is contained in, in yogurt, um, he found that those children had a greater rate of acquisition of tolerance to cow's milk after 12 months of treatment. So he gave us fecal samples from children that received this diet and also that received a diet without LGG. And what we found 
was that the children that had cow's milk allergy, this is at four months of age, had a bacterial population that looked entirely different from that in the healthy children. It had more diversity. It looked like the bacterial population of adults, as if it had gone through its maturation in, at warp speed. And that was very surprising to us. And we found what's showing you here is that it was more diverse, and even though the amount of bacteria present was the same. And particularly, what we noticed when we compared samples before and after treatment is that the children that received the formula that was associated with the acquisition of tolerance had high levels of butyric acid, that short-chain fatty acid that I told you was important for intestinal health that's produced by the fermentation of dietary fiber. They had much more of that in, detectable in their feces after treatment. So this leads to a picture. This is a, a, a schematic that was published um, in Nature and Scientific American last year, which suggests that there are populations of bacteria, including the Clostridia or another bacteria called Fecobacterium prausnitzi, that act to digest dietary fiber and produce butyrate to increase populations of immune system cells. I also told you about this barrier protective cytokine IL-22. And all of this is important for maintaining a healthy barrier, an intact mucus layer. But in the absence of what this author called the bacterial peacekeepers, you have a depleted mucus layer, more access of toxins and foods into the, into the body, into the circulation, more chance for disease. So how can we use this information to begin to develop treatments for food allergy? The way we decided to approach this was to take the fecal material from healthy infants or from allergic infants and put them into these germ-free mice and then sensitize them with a cow's milk protein. So the idea being that these mice would be non-allergic, they'd be protected, and these mice would become allergic. And we got this really mind-boggling result. So the, what I'm showing you here is that here in red are the mice that are, are colonized with the healthy infant's bacteria. Here in gray are mice that are colonized with the allergic infant's bacteria. And what we're looking at is a change in core, core body temperature. So when somebody goes into anaphylaxis, their core body temperature drops. And I, I think you can, you can readily appreciate if your core body temperature drops 8 degrees, that's a big problem. And these mice di are dying of anaphylaxis. So what's amazing here is that all we've given to the mice is the fecal material of those infants. And we've recapitulated the clinical phenotype. So we found then an atopic microbiome a microbiome that creates an allergic response. And I emphasize that all we're giving to these mice, that what's killing them is milk protein. That's all. So this then gives us a platform that we can use to screen potential therapeutics. And we formed a company on campus to do this. And some of the candidates are mixtures of bacteria that are identified by our sequence analysis a prebiotic dietary fibers, that is bacterial uh, fibers that have been selected specifically to expand butyrate-producing uh, clostridia, working in conjunction with a carbohydrate chemist. And finally, nanoformulations of butyrate working with um, the uh, collaborator at the Institute for Molecular Engineering. So I'll just uh, end by thanking all of the people and funding sources that have contributed to this work. It's a long-range potential use of what you did with the mice applicable to newborns who are born by cesarean section as a way of preventing them from getting allergy. Uh, so uh, one strat particular strategy that other people are pursuing, uh, not us, is to actually take vaginal swabs from mothers of cesarean babies and use those use that to, to inoculate, the, the inoculate the baby's mouth 
as, as they might have been had they been delivered vaginally. Because our, the children that are coming into our study have already got this altered microbiota at four months of age. It's already too late. So in, um, that's one approach that other groups are taking to address that issue. Are there any results from that? A very small study so far shows that, that it has some efficacy in colonizing those babies with the vaginal microbiota, but it's a very small scale so far. Thank you. Okay, good. We'll stop there. Thank you, Catherine. <laughs> good. Thank you. So I'd like to introduce our final speaker, uh, Christina Negri, who will be our uh, dessert course, although there will be dessert after this. She's a principal agronomist at Argonne National Laboratory, a senior fellow of the Energy Policy Institute at the University of Chicago, and a fellow of the Institute for Molecular Engineering. Christina's work encompasses the treatment of environmental problems through the use of plants. So lest you think Christina is all work and no play, she does confess to occasionally enjoying plum jam on a slice of rye bread, and she also insists that everything tastes better when sitting in the Italian Alps. Please welcome Christina to the stage. Thank you. And I need to hide away from that light. <laughs> Anyways, there's good things about being the last speaker. And, um, and thank you, Joshua, for making a very nice introduction to things that I don't have to discuss anymore because you know all about it. So what I'm going to talk to you about is really taking it a step further and saying, OK, we have all these problems. What can we do um, to make sure that our um, agricultural system becomes a little more whole than it is uh, now? And I should add a preface on my personal story. I am an agronomist by training, so I deal with crops, plants, soils, and things like that. Um, when I got into getting picking agriculture as my choice, I had this dream as a young person of agriculture being such a wonderful thing and man in, in balance with the environment and such a poetic and, and really kind of literary almost experience about agriculture. Maybe Virgil was in my back of having studied um, in Italy for a long time. I don't know. But obviously hard reality sets in and you realize that agriculture is probably one of the most polluting uh, things um, uh, on earth. Um, and I keep saying, and I have it somewhere that is probably, and Kathy, you may contradict me, but it's probably the largest and most the old, oldest geoengineering um, process that mankind has done to, to alter the, the environment. So I won't delve more into the challenges of agriculture, but basically how do we provide food, feed, fiber, energy, growing world population, climate change, old pressures, urbanization, and all that. I should add to, to what Joshua was saying, was saying is that here in the US, we are really talking about big eutrophication problems. This is a NOAA picture of the, the hypoxia in the Gulf of Mexico that mostly comes from the farm fields in our part of the world. I should also add that this is a very hard grainy thing to see, but, but that red thing there is the impact of in greenhouse gas, uh, CO2 equivalent of agriculture. The, 80% of that, more or less, it really comes from nitrous oxide, uh, which is really coming from the degradation of nitrogen fertilizers. So uh, what do we do about it? And do we have the right crops or not? Through the centuries, we went from true horsepower to mechanical horsepower, but the issues are the same. How do we feed people, get the energy we need, and, uh, and all the other uses we want to do? How does a, new, a resilient landscape look like? What can we do with that? And so I will take you a little closer to home um, in, in the agricultural Midwest. Uh, but the basic idea of what we do is really that this is a system level issue. We cannot take food production on one side, energy production, bioenergy production on another side, the fiber on the other side, and the conservation on the other one. Every practice, every use of resources really has to be seen with a lens in which we really take care of both agricultural production, the conservation, the bioenergy, that often in particular case, and rural economics and development. All of this with a perhaps more balanced impact where we take the ecology, the culture, the politics, and the economics all together. We don't have that little you know, reddish part here on the ecology. Everything has to be more in balance. So, so that's what we are trying to do. And again, um, we are really going in a small scale. And this wasn't supposed to be like this, but um, it got jammed up. And, and really m means to say that landscapes in agriculture are very dynamic and they change with time. So the slide before, the, the picture before this, the transition was a picture of a tall grass prairie, which was what we had in, in, in Illinois back uh, in the time. 
but, uh, and this is the last century, 1922, Staley opened its first soybean mill in, in Decatur, Illinois, where they were crushing soybeans, and they were actually making marketable products, oils and other things that were not really uh, food yet, but, but they were important. And, and sure enough, you find a market, and the landscape has uh, changed dramatically here, and uh, you see the, the increase in soybeans and how that has changed. Another big change was an organic fertilizer that enabled the shift to grain-only vegeta- uh, um, cropping. So you didn't have to have legumes. You didn't have to have anything that um, could be rotational. You have your corn, soybean, uh, you know, typical thing, which is the watch you see right here. That's a typical landscape land use right now in central Illinois, where the yellow is soybeans, the green is corn, and, and the next year is soybean corn, so it doesn't change. What we really want to get to is a more complex landscape like this, uh, which has a lot of problems and and costs money uh, because it takes away some land from production, but you have filter strips, you have grassy waterways, you have riparian forests, you have wetlands, you have windbreaks, you have a lot of more dynamic features in the landscape that actually make it uh, more, if you want to use a trite word, sustainable or more environmentally uh, complete. Uh, I should argue that multifunctional landscapes that we're trying to get are, are really old. And this is an example from my hometown. This is actually a wet meadow, a marcita in Italian, uh, which is a very ancient cultivation system were important from France in the 12th century by the Benedictine monks. Uh, what they were doing is that it basically, in this particular case, taking the dirty water from the city of Milan, and they were actually feeding them to these you know, winged crops Uh, so that they had a constant layer of running water in that. And what you had is two things. They would recycle all the nutrients in there, all the nitrogen, the phosphate that we, um, that the people, you know, lost, you know, through the sewer. Uh, At the same time, we're actually reusing the thermal energy of the water, which was uh, above zero. And with the constant flow, they were actually... As you can see, snow didn't grow, it didn't stay there. It was melting, and that allowed crops to grow um, very late in the, in the winter and very early in the spring. So actually, Napoleonic troops had actually had fresh forage for their horses, and that's why they liked that area. They really could, could uh, feed them uh, throughout. Um, I should add that we have a very, very distinguished engineer who developed all the hydraulics for the system. It's Leonardo in 1494 developing the, uh, the water stairs and the way to, to feed the water gently to these systems. So, so we can go there and take inspiration from these systems and do something. And what we have been thinking here in, in our own country here and try to address our issue is really how can we intensify land use in, in a way that we can really live for a long time with it for many, many, many times. And so the recipe for this that we have come up with is land that's not so suitable for grain production, uh, but it's still agricultural land in production. And the concept of industrial ecology, recycling things, that agriculture has been kind of reluctant to, to do, at least in the industrial forms. And then the main ingredient is these different crops. They're perennial crops. It's the switchgrass. It's the, it's, the, it's the woody crops. It's the prairie grasses. All these grasses which are perennial contrary to corn and soybeans. And what they can do is they develop and invest in a root system that's deep enough to actually um, in influence deeper than, than, than the thin surface. And they can actually add as traps and, and do a lot of things. And what you see here is one of our field sites. This is in Nebraska. But the idea was, can we take the nitrogen that's lost by corn and recycle it into the next crops right there? And so we can actually improve on what is still impossibly low efficiency. NUE stands for nitrogen use efficiency. Corn is a very leaky system. You give 100 units of fertilizer, of nitrogen fertilizer, it only takes 60. The rest is lost through water, through air, where you want, but it's lost. If we couple it with something else, and this particular case is bioenergy crops because DOE funds me to look at bioenergy, uh, but it could be forage, it could be anything else, you actually can recycle that, that rest of nitrogen that is actually lost. And that's what we are really trying to do. As a result, you have lower externalities, you have better crops for the farmers and a potential income. So that's what we are working on. And um, uh, when we look at marginal land and, and all that, that's a, another very loaded term. What we're really looking at is not really conservation land, is not land is not explored. It's really, really, really where we are already growing veget- uh, ve- um, plants and, and corn in this particular case. And, and I'm probably the only person that thinks that a trip from Chicago to Urbana-Champaign is actually a very interesting landscape to see. Uh, <laughs> everybody sees just corn. I end up seeing places where there's erosion, places where you have risk of floods, places where nothing really grows because it's too wet. And those are the areas we're focusing on where really farmers don't really get a whole lot. And I'll give you a good example with our field site. 
This is very small. Again, I'm taking you to a small scale. This is a 16-acre field, so about six hectares or something like that. And it's in Fairbury, Illinois. Um, and uh, what we have here, what you see here is a product of, of uh, precision ag. So farmers um, harvest their corn, and they have a GPS um, locator in there that actually records the, the mass, the weight of, of, of grains um, every, I want to say, 10 square meters or so. And so you have this very composite map, a lot of data in there, but it really gives you a really good picture of what happens at the field scale in a, in, in a cornfield. You have areas where you eventually you turn into profits. There are areas where you have make a lot of money as a farmer, areas that you don't make a, a money at all, right? And that's the area we want to think about something else. Coincidentally, the same area that you have very low revenues and, and profits is also an area where you actually find most of the nitrogen that farmers apply is lost. It goes down about a meter and a half way away from the uh, root of corn. So it won't be, it, it's lost. It's lost to the environment. So how can a farmer spend a lot of money to put that fertilizer in? It's lost and the corn and, and, and they never make the money back. So what to do about it? Well, you put, put a, a barrier there, a, a willow barrier in this particular case, which is what we did in, in the field, and suddenly you actually get a, a dramatic reduction in the loss of, of nitrates that go in there, and you actually sequester the nitrogen in the vegetation. I don't want to go too much into these data, but, but it works. It can work. The only problem is that you have a slightly longer season, and therefore you have a slightly higher water consumption. So all is good, and I think the system that we've proved is, is, is working what if we expanded this? And we looked at all this kind of land in the small watershed. This is working at, at watershed. We work with farmers, so we, we do a lot of feedback with the farmers going in the Indian Creek watershed in Livingston County, Illinois, about an hour and a half from here. And what if we change from this to this? And the red parts in there are all the land that fits that, that, that kind of characteristics as we have in our field site. Well, we would see that we would lose some of the... Um, corn production and soybean production at the same time would increase dramatically the production of, in this particular case, switchgrass. So what to do with that? Obviously, could we think of a way where we actually convert some of the corn that's produced, that's making ethanol into lignocellulosic switchgrass that can make some better fuel from it? Uh, can we think about forage switchgrass? Can replace some of the corn that goes for feed? About 40% of the corn that's grown goes for feeding animals. So can we think of that? But if we did that, then we would actually, actually have much decreased um, um, sediment and nitrogen outputs in there. So we would improve our water. And incidentally, the same landscape that would be optimized for water quality would also provide us benefits in terms of pollinator nesting index indices. So we would actually improve the, 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 the livelihood of, of natural pollinators. So economically, this would actually be a good solution for farmers as well. If you think willows is not a really a money-making endeavor, but if you substituted a willow for the corn that we already seen doesn't grow very well, the opportunity cost is pretty good, uh, unless the corn is growing really well. In that case, it is similar. But, but basically, there is a window there of opportunity. And I should ask, why would actually a farmer ever grow that corn in that particular part of the field? And the answer is, subsidies and uh, uh, crop insurance, basically. So is there a better way to do it? Uh, they actually have a benefit in doing that because what we have found is the cost of our silly willows is really com much better probably than some other conservation practices in there. So there could be an incentive. The, the big problem in there that we don't have a market for willows yet. And uh, you know, we, we need to develop these markets and, and, and really find a way to do it. Uh, but, uh, but I think that all in all, it, it's been proving that, that that a system like this could actually be a lot more balanced and a lot more um, uh, productive um, than, uh, than what we have now. So in summary, really, we have multiple needs to be, need to be addressed. Uh, they all need to be addressed at the same time. And by doing that, we really need to, to pull it up and, and really have a broader view, a, 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 a higher observation point where we can really think of systems approach as engineers and, 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 and scientists and really think of the system and how we optimize that. And uh, uh, we need to develop markets and we need the valuation of ecosystem services. And until we put a, a number value on the value of making clean water, right, um, what society would pay for it, then 
we won't have a system that works. But, but I think we're at the point that the trading mechanisms are starting to begin even for nutrients in there. So as scientists, what do we want to do and where can we go with this? You know, particularly we need to be able to nest spatial scales, computational systems and, and computer models that allow us to go from a small field to the farm, to the watershed, to the region. Somehow the reverse from what Joshua is talking about and, and somewhere meet us you know, somewhere in the middle. Temporal scales, we go from the annual crops to perennials to the scale of the carbon accruals in soils. Uh, precision agriculture, sensing networks for data-driven research will improve our models greatly. We have a tremendous amount of data that are generated and finally we probably have the, the ways to, to handle that data to get some meaningful information. And finally, we really need to be totally multidisciplinary in this. We need to integrate supply chains, markets, logistics, policy, economics, land ownership, the physical and the human landscape. And so that's it, and you know it's done because it's the thank you slide. <laughs> All the people <laughs> who have been working in the field with, with us and our sponsors. I'd like to know uh, what you think about GMOs. Sorry? Uh, genetically uh, engineered uh, corn and beans. Uh, how it plays into the nutrients, do they are they engineering this to use less nutrients? Or uh, how does that work out? So genetic engineering you know, crops are, are part of the landscape already. Uh, particularly soybeans and corn are, are really heavily, you know, there's many, many um, varieties that are genetically engineered. Um, if you talk to Monsanto, they think that it's obviously the most important thing that you can do to, to feed the world. Um, there's a lot of work that's happening on, on trying to, to develop um, corn types, corn genotypes that are more resistant to drought, for instance, and, and things like that. Um, I don't know if we have studied entirely the, the impacts of this, but uh, it's not for me to say, so I don't really have a particular, other than watching what's going on, I don't really have a particular opinion whether pro or con. I'm unsurprised to hear that beef in particular has a lot of problems. I guess I'm wondering how other possible meat sources compare, like salmon or rabbits or insects. You know, are those all also still terrible, or are, how how less terrible are they? Joshua, Is that for me. Okay, um, <laughs> two of you, I think. Talk. No, uh, uh, all other meat sources are significantly less terrible, um, and it's uh, definitely beef. Beef is definitely the most resource intensive um, of large scale production. Um, sheep and mutton, I think, is a relatively close second. Um, you know, dairies also can be very, very resource intensive depending on, there's a lot of different factors that, that, that influence things, of course, depending on what, what the feedstock is. Are we talking about, are we talking about industrial farming where the feedstock is, is you know, uh, corn and soy or, or distiller dried grains as a byproduct from um, thing? Are we talking about pasture, cows and things? Um, so there's a, there's a lot of different ones. So I don't necessarily want to say that cows are horrible. Um, <laughs> Uh, but uh, uh, but certainly absolutely um, um, a lot of other a lot of other um, uh, uh, meat meat um, sources are a lot less energy intensive than is uh, meat and mutton. It's, it's the herbivore. <laughs> Did you want to add physiology? Right. I'm sorry. It's the herbivore physiology that, that, that has really a really bad energy balance basically because you have to have a lot of grass or feed to actually turn into meat, right? So, um, so I thought the theme of food choices was really prevalent in all of the speakers. And one thing that kept coming back in my mind was all of these choices on to have the most, like, have the highest quality, highest sustainable foods. Those options aren't available for everyone. There's a giant class issue that comes into play, whether it's the ordinary to the elite classes in 15th century India to even food deserts in Chicago. So I was wondering, uh, anyone can ask this question. What would be a good start to um, get away from that imbalance and to make food more available and better choices, healthier, more sustainable choices available for everyone? Consumption is always uh, linked to political economy, right, and to issues of power and access to resources. And that's been true historically as it has, as is true now, right? Um, you know, one difference between the sort of case study of the 14th to 16th century that I talked about 
and, and now uh, in the world that we live in, say here at Chicago, is that in you know the sort of dry interior of southern India, the elite cuisine was one was the one in a sense that had the most pervasive and significant kinds of environmental damage and the highest energy costs. Um, the dry farming of you know the poor eating millets and so on, while well, was also extremely risky and you know people I mean this is not this is not an ancient story people are still doing this, um, very problematic in terms of livelihoods, also turns out to be very healthy, right? So one thing that I didn't get a chance to talk about is there's a kind of uh, fascinating millet revival in, in India right now, in southern India in particular, where sort of very, very uh, affluent, uh, elite, urban educated people are you know, going back in a sense to eating millets um, because they're very healthy or they're seen as um, sort of heritage grains and because uh, there's a huge incidence of diabetes in South India, and uh, doctors always tell their patients not to eat rice, and that they should eat something like millets instead. So sometimes it's actually you know the foods of the dispossessed, <laughs> which are more healthy you know than the foods of the affluent. Which is, I think that's something that Joshua also mentioned in terms of things like uh, per capita meat consumption and its relationship uh, to to uh, income levels. So, I mean, the answer, I mean, the, there's no simple answer to that question because it's a question about the distribution of resources and, and access to income and, and to, to, to power in, in a society. So the answer is going to be different for each place. Uh, well, I mean, just in bringing that into the present day language, I mean, there's certainly ways that we can reorganize our policy and subsidy structures in the food system in order to encourage um, better food and better food access, especially in urban places. I mean, in rural places, it's true, where people are growing their own food, you know, they're growing a, lo a lot of times more in, in a more environmentally friendly and healthy food. But in urban places, sometimes the only thing that's available is processed food, or the only thing that's affordable is this highly processed food. And part of that is because of the way we're subsidizing food. Um, as was mentioned, I mean, the, you know, the way, the fact that, you know, um, big commodity uh, crops like um, grains and soybean and things are subsidized, and in some ways, animal production is subsidized. Um, and if we could figure out ways, and I don't have any, I don't have answers, so please don't ask me a follow-up question. But if we can figure out ways to restructure some of that subsidy and spend some of that money in ways that will more equally distribute those healthy foods to places where it's needed, I think that could be an important part of it. We should be more and interested in the farm bill than we are. Yeah. Yes, exactly. <laughs> but a lot of it is also education, and well, obviously, education alone won't will not increase the supply, right? But, but at least will we'll create a demand, perhaps. Question for Catherine, just a point for simple information. You talked about babies who were uh, four months old mm -hmm. and showing um, allergies against milk. That means cow's milk or yes. mother's milk? Okay, so yes. if you have babies that are born um, cesarean uh, but are only drinking mother's milk, do you delay the problem? Do you not see the problem? Do you have data about that? So if, if they're not exposed to cow's milk at all, they're not going to have cow's milk allergy yet, but we don't see that breastfeeding is, even babies that are breastfed and vaginally delivered are susceptible to food allergies. So yes, so that, that, that alone doesn't explain the whole problem. Pretty broad question here um, based on the agricultural methods that we use today, has anyone calculated a uh, carrying capacity of, of planet Earth using, say, like the least efficient uh, way we eat today versus the most efficient? Not, not anyone on the stage, I'm guessing, unless you have, I don't know. Um, there, it, it is, it's, it's estimated that we produce enough food globally today to feed the entire, popu in, to feed the entire population now. And that with, you know, in the, with the most efficient diets, uh, if a transition was made to the most efficient diets, i.e., you know, pseudo-vegan, vegetarian diets, um, that with land and production today, we could probably feed the 9 billion population um, that we're expecting to have in 2050. Um, so, you know, you could solve the entire problem in theory on the, on the demand side by eliminating waste, by reducing diets to 
in in um, in uh, Western countries to to actual um, you know to the uh, to the levels that are actually um, to the amount of calories that are actually suggested rather than rather than too many and reducing dramatically meat consumption. So um, you know in theory and in in a, in a perfect world where everyone's a vegetarian, you could support. 9 billion, probably 12 billion, just to randomly say a number, um, with expanded agricultural areas and other sorts of things. Um, that might be a, a sort of a carrying capacity, if you will. Um, that's just a random number, though, so don't write it down or record it. This isn't being recorded. Is it? <laughs> yeah, no. this, um, this won't be on YouTube, don't worry. But with, but with standard diets and with the diets that we assume that we'll have over the next several decades, um, it, that would be significantly reduced. Um, and again, I don't, you know, I, I have serious questions, as I think my talk implied, about whether or not we can feed 9 billion people by 2050 um, under the current trajectories of diets and wealth that we have. And especially with the, you know, with the stated goals of the United Nations of reducing hunger and malnutrition, um, you know, in fact, eliminating it within the next um, decade or two. Um, I, you know, I think that that's going to be a really, really tough challenge. So. Well, particularly if you don't if you don't want to convert land, it's already in some kind of natural state, right? You don't want to obviously take down the Amazon forest to make soybeans. You don't want to deforest, uh, take to down some other forest. You don't want to take away wetlands. You, don't, you know you cannot actually encroach on on these kind of land uses. You need to stay with what you have, right? Ideally. In terms of food vulnerability uh, in a changing climate, what do you see as being the more disruptive impact? Is it steady state increases or is it more the uh, increased prevalence of extremes? Well, it's a little bit of a philosophical question. I'll answer some quickly and then let other people answer, but it gets into a little bit of a philosophical question. Um, Human beings have shown throughout thousands of years, I think it's safe to say, that they are very, very good at adapting to slow changes. Um, now, granted, um, climate change, especially under sort of aggressive pathways, is going to be pushing us uh, well outside of a, of a global regime, uh, environmental regime that we've ever experienced before. But um, you know, you can say with a, you, I, I could still say with a reasonable probability that if it was just a slow change that we had to adapt for. Um, that we'd figure it out somehow. Uh, we'd have to change where we're growing food, obviously. Canada's going to become the new breadbasket. Cotton's going to be growing in Iowa instead of in Texas. You know, there's going to be a lot of changes, but we're human beings. That's what we do, right? We adapt, we change. But the increased variability and the increased extreme events, um, that's something we have not shown a good ability to adapt to. Uh, we've done some work in our group that shows that if we were hit with another Dust Bowl now in the U.S., it would hurt us pretty much just as bad. Yes, we have agricultural insurance and we have, you know, farm, you know, farm, you know, all sorts of programs that would help save farmers from, you know, having to move to California and, and, and you know, complete destitution and et cetera. Uh, but, um, but it would still, it would still be just as devastating in terms of agricultural productivity. We really haven't gotten any better at dealing with extreme drought uh, or extreme weather. Uh, more broadly. So I, I would personally say variability, but it is a bit of a philosophical question.